Hi everyone, uh, my name is Deanna Clark and today's presentation will be on managing a U.S. customs hold for a shipment destined to an OFAC sanctioned country. Now, I'd like to just share a little bit about uh, why I am interested in even doing this kind of a program today. A uh, little bit about me. So I'm the managing attorney and the founder of the Clark Esposito Law Firm. I have two decades of successful experience in regulatory compliance for companies involved in the international sales of goods and other highly regulated industries. Now, in my 20 years as an attorney, I've learned that people typically don't ask for help until it's too late. And so I'm hoping by doing this presentation and sharing it on YouTube, that companies will learn both what could be at stake in addition to when to go ahead and get help, which I'll cover at the end of the webinar. It's not often that we come across a case which has implications for both an importer and an exporter that binds U.S. Customs and the Office of Foreign Assets Control, our Bureau of Industry and Security, which are really our export controls agencies uh, together. More commonly, there's either a customs violation, which is handled by U.S. Customs, also known as CBP, or there's one involving export controls for which OFAC, BIS, and another office out of Census, uh, excuse me, out of the Department of Commerce known as Census, are most commonly involved. Uh, with these agencies working more closely together as partners in protecting national security interests, however, I thought it would be good to talk about this subject. Now, just a quick disclaimer that nothing here should be construed uh, as legal advice. So I want to set the stage about how does this situation even arise? Um, a U.S. exporter can unknowingly be sending off a shipment and it turns out that an allegation is made of a prohibited transaction, or it could be that the foreign buyer has purchased merchandise from a U.S. seller only to have an allegation made of a prohibited transaction. So the end result is that there is an allegation that there's a violation of export controls. Now, how does, it, how does the government even come to suspect a company, right? There's a few different ways. Uh, the first could be that they are already conducting an investigation on a company, and then they happen to learn of other companies. Once they learn about these other companies, then you know, now they're taking that deep dive into the transaction history of the case at hand, but in addition to that, looking at these other parties involved. Where have their transactions been? How can they link the pieces? Uh, it can also be that just in looking at the paperwork, something doesn't add up. U.S. Customs has agents all over the world. Uh, of course, they can work with different other agencies, and so they're able to connect the dots, if you will, uh, an example I have here has to do with looking at a customs entry where bananas are claiming to originate from Poland. Uh, as we all know, uh, they don't have the climate to support, you know, growing bananas. So that type of an instance would create a red flag uh, and lead to further investigation. The government could also come to suspect a company because somebody has blown the whistle. Uh, so. It could be for public policy reasons, uh, national security, health, or otherwise. Um, an example of blowing the whistle we recently saw um, with, the, with the airlines, and there had been some whistleblowers related to quality standards and quality checks being made. That's just an example of what whistleblowing is. So the case study I plan to discuss today is in relation to where a U.S. seller ships to a foreign buyer prepaid goods. That is, the foreign buyer has already paid for the goods, and so now the U.S. seller is simply providing confirmation that the merchandise has been placed onto the conveyance, so onto the carrier. And what I want you to bear in mind is that there's two sides to this transaction. There is one who's the exporter in the case of the U.S. They're the U.S. principal party in interest or U.S. PPI. And then there is the receiving party or the consignee who is the foreign purchaser. Okay. In looking at this kind of transaction, we have to ask the question, what's at stake? 
And so in the case of the purchaser, when they're looking at a violation, right, for export controls, uh, or rather an allegation of such violation, uh, the purchaser is waiting for this merchandise. Um, CBP has now held on to it or it hasn't arrived. So the purchaser is at risk of losing the merchandise. They may never receive it. Their money has already been spent on it. In this example, it was paid in full, prepaid. Uh, there could also be instances where it's partially paid. It can suffer damage to its reputation. Uh, its reputation could be with respect to the government who may be investigating them. And so now every shipment to them is suspect. Uh, there could be other would-be purchasers where word got around. I found in my experience with clients, it's not uncommon that where there's an issue, they will turn to their colleagues in the industry and ask the question, have you experienced this before, right? Uh, so unintentionally, they end up helping to spread uh, the word. Uh, and the result could be that their counterparts could now fear being associated with that company because if the government is looking into them, could the government be looking now into our company as well if we're associated with them? Um, so let's discuss the next bullet point, this harm by being associated. Uh, and of course, it could damage the relationship where this consignee, the foreign purchaser, intends to resell the goods to another party. Uh, that other party is waiting for these goods. And so if they can't deliver them to them, they're damaging that relationship. On the part of the U.S. seller, the U.S. PPI, what's at stake is now losing the foreign buyer as a customer. Uh, oftentimes, you know, believe it or not, it, it doesn't have to be the first shipment that becomes a problem. Two parties could have had a relationship for you know, whatever amount of time, and now all of a sudden there's a problem with this shipment. Uh, the seller could also risk losing any remaining money if there is money that remains to be paid. They're also at risk of a potential lawsuit for money paid on any undelivered prepaid shipments. Uh, like the purchaser, they may have harm to their reputation, again, by government, other purchasers, or its counterparts in the industry. Uh, and also it could suffer from the harm by being associated with a suspect transaction or party. Now, it's important to remember that those risks are independent of any intrusive government investigation that either party could be subject to, including any fines or penalties. So, you know, if a company finds itself in this situation, um, it's like there's nothing going on. What's the first clue that there may be a U.S. customs hold? Uh, so the first clue is simply that the shipment doesn't arrive. You know, typically the seller is looking for confirmation by the buyer that the goods have been received. And when this doesn't happen, then all eyes turn to the carrier for an explanation, right? So what happened? Where is it? What's the delay? Um, you know, in, in the case of this example, the explanation is that the shipment actually arrived to the foreign port of entry only to be turned around due to U.S. Customs hauling it back to the U.S., right? So it got almost there, um, but rather than being let out of the Customs custody of this foreign country, U.S. Customs asked that it be returned, and so the carrier went back and returned it to customs. So now it's in customs possession. Customs, of course, you know, is governed uh, by statute. They create the regulations that oversee how imports uh, are supposed to be handled, including when they decide to hold on to a shipment. So they're supposed to issue uh, what's known as a detention notice where it's detained the goods, and it can also issue what's known as a seizure notice when it's gone ahead and seized the goods. Now, a seizure meaning they've taken the goods and they do not intend to return the goods either to the seller or have them delivered to the buyer. And in this case, we have to ask ourselves, how does U.S. Customs know who to send the seizure notice to? 
right? Normally it would send it to the US party. They're based in the United States. It's within the US jurisdiction. Uh, in this case, however, because the, the purchaser has paid in full for the goods, title to the goods has passed to the purchaser and the exporter is now the owner, right? So who does customs even send this to? Um, if, if, as stated in this next bullet point, you know, if the foreign buyer is already paid and is the rightful owner, shouldn't the seizure notice go to that party? Uh, and if that purchaser hasn't done anything wrong, has no intent to do anything wrong, uh, irrespective of whatever customs internal investigation is showing, uh, shouldn't it be entitled to its already paid goods, right? So the place to start really is to try and get a copy of the seizure notice, which, you know, is actually easier said than done. Um, where customs may be conducting an investigation, it could last for several months. And so they may never have issued a detention notice. They also may never have issued a seizure notice. And they also may not know who should this go to. Right? Now, I'll tell you, typically, because it's treated as an, a violation of an export control, it will go to the US PPI, the US PPI being uh, the US seller. The problem, of course, is it's unknown to what extent the relationship remains amicable between the buyer and the seller. If they have a history, if this is, you know, something neither expected, which it normally is, by the way, uh, that relationship may be ongoing with the thinking that, hey, this will get resolved, let's continue. Uh, on the other hand, it may not be as amicable. And so, you know, where you go next with it uh, can depend on these factors as well. Now, when you get a seizure notice, time is of the essence. And this is because there's only 30 days to respond to US Customs. They issue a seizure notice and you have 30 days from the date of that letter. And, you know, as the purchaser, if we're talking about the foreign buyer, they've already paid for the goods. Of course, their interest is in actually getting the goods. Um, in order to respond, of course, you need to have the seizure notice because the seizure notice contains the case number, which has been assigned by the fines, penalties, and forfeitures office at U.S. Customs. The seizure notice will also provide the legal basis for the seizure, uh, and it will also you know, help you in some ways, depending on which side you're on, uh, indicate that you're the rightful owner. Now, you should know that uh, even if it is directed to the U.S. PPI, that does not mean that another interested party may not come and petition for the release of the goods, right? Uh, the reason for this is, that, well, it's just part of customs rules. So they allow either the party to whom the seizure notice has been sent to or another interested party to come forward, clarify how it is that they have an interest in the property. So that normally means ownership, okay? Um, because how else will they release it to you? Um, now, you have to understand, customs does not treat every case the same. As I mentioned just a moment ago, in the seizure notice, they provide the basis, so the legal basis for its seizure. And depending on what that basis is, and this is across the board, whether related to export controls or, or another reason, um, that is going to play a role in part anyway, in whether or not they agree to release the goods. Um, and I also wanna point out that um, if there is a shipment and if for whatever reason, your shipment, for example, happened to be packed into the same container uh, as something else, which they suspect may be violative, um, you can always petition to get that portion out, which is not violative, okay? Uh, coming back to the slide, this last, uh, second to last bullet point I've got here. 
um, you know, talking about the time delay that customs may not have issued a seizure notice for several months due to an ongoing investigation. And uh, it may also be the case that when you request a seizure notice, one will not be given. Now, it can happen that one will not be given because no case number has been assigned because no seizure notice has happened, right? So in this type of a case, you want to reach out to customs, try to find out where this is. And of course, you need to establish your interests in the goods. Uh, and then you take it from there. Okay. So what needs to be determined, right? Um, we want to find out, has a seizure notice been issued? And if so, to whom was it issued? We want to try and make sense of who is U.S. Customs even concerned about. Is it us or is it them? Uh, because maybe as a foreign reseller, you have been inaccurately told the true destination or use of the merchandise that you're reselling to a third party. Maybe you didn't know that you needed to ask. Uh, and if that's the case, I want to let you know right now, um, you do need to ask, you do need to know who your customer is, who it is that you're dealing with because of this legal framework related to export controls, OFAC sanctions. Um, it could be the case that customs has been investigating the U.S. exporter, but you never asked, so they never mentioned it. Okay, And it's not even necessarily the case that they were doing this on purpose. Um, we have talked to many companies where they come to us. Yes, they've been asked these questions before, uh, but we're dealing with this other issue. So let's focus on that. Uh, side note, when we work with clients, we take a, an overall holistic look at their customs, at their export transactions to understand where they might be at risk. Um, and so I know that it's not always the case that it's intentional to not disclose. Uh, and because of that, it's, you know, the onus is on the party trying to actually obtain the merchandise to ask those questions to make sure, just so that you don't run into the problem of working with somebody who either is a so-called bad, act bad actor or who appears to be a bad actor. Okay. Um, okay. So who at U.S. Customs is even doing an investigation of this kind? Um, they have an investigatory wing at U.S. Customs known as Homeland Security Investigation. And their mantra is that we shield our nation from global threats to ensure Americans are safe and secure, right? So they're looking at all sorts of national security issues. They talk not only internally with the different offices within the agency, but also with other agencies. And other agencies who might be involved could be the U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury, their Office of Foreign Assets Control. It could be the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security. Again, export controls. Uh, Department of Treasury is where Office of Foreign Assets Control is, OFAC, looking at OFAC sanctions. And then there is the Department of Commerce's Census Office. I mention all of these because there is a risk that the first three agencies may have investigations happening. They could be happening all at the same time. They could start happening because U.S. Customs has notified OFAC and notified BIS, so they begin conducting their own internal investigation. Uh, and the last one raises a threat of a penalty or other enforcement action due to the uh, export filing, AES, the Automated Export System Filing, being incorrect. I mention incorrect because it could be the case that a license could have been applied for, but hadn't been. One thing that is noted on this AES filing it is whether or not there is a license that's required. If there is, even where there is an exception, you would still indicate that a license is required, but that there's an exception and you cite that exception. Um, and so 
you know, this, this is why all of these agencies might be involved. And the reason why an issue arises has to do with three things. One is the destination, one is the end use, and one is the end user. And they could be in concert, they could be individual, or it could be a two out of three, right? So these other agencies get involved in enforcement for shipments to restricted or prohibited destinations. And this is more obvious, like North Korea or Russia, which we can basically do nothing with at this time. There are also less obvious reasons, such as the end use. Ordinarily, if you're exporting apparel, you're not really thinking about where it might be going. On the other hand, if uniforms are destined for a particular location where it's known that within driving distance, you are now at this foreign military base, or there may be a prison labor camp, well, that's gonna call into question the end use. <laughs> also, there can be an issue related to end users and end users are either entities, it could be a company, it could be a financial institution, could also be people, individuals uh, on their own, it could, and oftentimes is, um, individuals related to those in government. And so, uh, these come up. And one of the biggest risks to foreign purchasers is that as a result of an investigation that they themselves are placed onto a restricted or a prohibited list that requires a petition to the U.S. government to remove it from such list. Um, an example of this would be what's known as the unverified list. Um, the government has all of these, you know, they're, they're, publicly available, you can find out what they are, and then they also seem sort of obscure. Uh, they can be regulated, you know, yesterday and now today, there's a restriction against a party that you've been doing business with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not always so clear what's going on, who's involved, and when they became suspect to any one of these U.S. government agencies. So I wanna talk a little bit about penalties. Um, the penalties are serious and they will vary depending on the nature uh, you know, of the alleged violation that's made. So these next few, few slides are just sharing a bit about what penalties could be, okay? Um, with respect to a claim of fraud in US customs, it could warrant a civil penalty up to the value of the merchandise in question. You want to bear in mind that if there is a claim of fraud, if the claim is also that you willfully knew if you purposely engaged in fraudulent activity, then you run the risk of your case potentially being referred over to the U.S. Attorney's Office for criminal prosecution. Okay, so um, of course, with any type of criminal, there runs the possibility of jail time. So you know, anything willful or what could be construed as willful, you will want to tread, you know, very carefully in managing a response to an allegation that creates uh, penalties being issued. There could also be penalties issued where there's a claim of gross negligence. Um, a grossly negligent violation is punishable by one of several civil penalties you could be required to pay a penalty up to the value of the merchandise, four times the lawful duties, taxes and fees may be owed to the government, or 40% of the duty, dutiable value of the merchandise could be at stake. So again, you know, not for the faint of heart. Lastly, uh, for a claim of negligence, uh, it could also have one of several penalties. So you'd be responsible to pay up to either the value of the merchandise, two times the value of the duties, taxes, and fees owed to the U.S., or 20% of the dutiable value of the merchandise. I just want to mention here also, you know, if goods have been held by the government um, where you're able to get them released, there are still other fees. There are still other fees for them having stored, you know, they describe it as storage, um, for their time storing it. 
There may be um, other fees involved for work performed by customs officers, you know. So it's not quite a full picture, uh, but you can, you know, definitely count on the bill coming. With respect to the Office of Foreign Assets Control, uh, where they were to open up an investigation and they found that there was a problem and they issued penalties. Uh, their civil penalties could be quarter million dollars or twice the value of each non-compliant transaction uh, or up to a million seventy-five thousand dollars per violation. And, you know, even though the numbers are um, in red here, each is is another key thing to recall here. Um, depending on the nature of the transaction, each could be, you know, one instance, each could be 10, um, or each could be way more. So this is why there is the cap, right, per, per violation, um, as opposed to a cap per transaction. Okay, it's just an overall cap where this violation has uh, been issued. And there's also criminal penalties ranging from $50,000 to 10 million uh, in fines, along with 10 to 30 years in prison. So again, depending on the facts, but they, they could be you know, substantial. Uh, the same goes for the Bureau of Industry and Security. For their criminal penalties, you're looking at up to 20 years in prison or up to a million dollars in fines per violation or both. Uh, there's also administrative monetary penalties up to $300,000 per violation or twice the value of the transaction. So whatever is greater, you know, they'll take the greater amount, not a problem for them. Okay. So I want to get into how it is that you can protect yourself. And I've got a few ways uh, that, that this can be done. So, um, you know, whether... Uh, you're the U.S. seller or you're the foreign buyer, running your business, part of your standard operating procedures, you want to provide them with your due diligence questionnaire. You want to know your customer, which is oftentimes, you know, searchable as KYC. Uh, this would include questions about recent outreach to or from the, any government agencies, uh, whether or not they were ever subject to an investigation themselves or by a government agency at any time that the company has been in existence. You know, just because there was an old investigation when so-and-so worked here doesn't mean that it has no relevance now that there's a new person in that role. Um, as a party doing international business, you wanna understand who you're working with, who is on their board of directors, how long have they been selling these products for? Do they know or can they share with you to what countries are they typically working with? What types of companies uh, in the case of the exporter, you know, who do they normally sell this to? Have, have they done any of their own due diligence with respect to, um, okay, if we're selling, um, you know, wall bearings, which are used in all kinds of machines, for example, are any of our customers known to manufacture weapons? Um, these are the types of questions you want to have in the questionnaire to make sense of who am I really working with. Another way to protect yourself has to do with asking uh, if they know if their company or anyone on their company's board of directors are or were on any government restricted or prohibited party lists. Uh, so if you're a U.S. company, you're not allowed to conduct business with any such parties. So you want to make sure, and just as part of your ordinary compliance program, verify that they are not on any lists. Now, if you're a foreign company, uh, by doing business with a U.S. company that has had government investigations, you yourself run the risk of being added to a restricted party list due to potentially erroneous allegations of wrongdoing. Believe it or not, our government has over a hundred different lists that you can be placed on. Some are with respect to domestic companies. Some are with respect to foreign companies. And so you want to always just make sure that you've attempted 
to ensure no transactions of any sort of violative nature has occurred, right? You've done that work, you've documented it, you hold on to it for the requisite record keeping period of time. Uh, because even if you mess up, right? And maybe there's an investigation happening with another company, things get pointed back to you, you're able to say, hey, look, I attempted to ensure that I was not engaged in any wrongdoing. Believe it or not, having compliance programs documented, so in writing, I know they tend to be in somebody's head at the organization, having them written out, having some other evidence that, hey, we did this periodic review, we looked at some past shipments, uh, we made sure that we followed our procedures. Yes, this questionnaire was done. No, there were no red flags. Yes, there were these red flags. We circled back, asked them these questions. We were comfortable with their answers. And so we proceeded with the transaction. The government wants to see that you're trying to comply because trying to comply leads to a higher chance of actually complying, right? So um, you always want to make sure you've got your processes documented and then some evidence that you did a periodic review, your internal audit to show that, hey, we came back and went through this, that of course you've done updated versions, you've updated your existing written uh, policies and procedures that govern international transactions and that you have it immediately available in the event of an investigation. Uh, now, another way uh, is just to vet the other party. You know, you can start with an internet search, put their name in, put the name of the leadership in. We've seen companies, they change names, you know. Um, now this owner is with this company. Search the name of the owners, okay? Anything that raises a question, circle back and ask them. And again, in your documentation, in your due diligence program, you want to have, you know, conducted internet search. Just document a few of the searches that were done. Uh, you also want to do a sanction search. Is this other party, you know, somehow restricted? Are they on some kind of a list? Um, you want to have done and documented that. Nope, we didn't find anything and they're cleared. Okay. Um, now. How do you get to a resolution, right? Because th the strategy for tackling this actually, it'll vary, you know, it'll vary depending upon what the facts are, including what your relationship is with the other party. Um, if either is even to blame, right? It may be that you're both victims to an investigation by a third party. Could be that the freight forwarder that is being used is responsible for, I'll give you an example, um, responsible for deliveries to a prohibited destination. And you're unaware of that, right? Both of, of you parties can be thinking, okay, this transaction is legitimate, it's destined for here, there shouldn't be any violations. But it could be that in fact, nope, it's actually heading somewhere else. Customs or Homeland Security investigations, they're aware that this is going on and you're both simply victims to this other investigation. Um, jumping to number four, um, it could be that you have shared uh, with the government some information, not realizing that you're under investigation. We've had it be the case where, um, you know, a carrier reached out to a client and then, you know, it's like, oh, well, we wanna be cooperative. We have nothing to hide. There's sort of this uh, moral, you know, hierarchy of how much to share. Let's overshare to show that, you know, we're not trying to hide anything. But if you do that uh, and you don't have any guidance on what to share, of course you want to share, uh, but you don't want to share more than you have to, right? So we've seen that be the case where thanks to the oversharing, uh, now we are under investigation. And of course, there could be any other number of circumstances uh, that lead to that. Now, I want to point out that most companies, uh, they have some kind of legal counsel, right? Whether they have an in-house attorney 
or they have a, a corporate attorney that they work with. Maybe they have an immigration attorney that they use because they're hiring foreign employees. Um, whatever the case may be, um, those attorneys are generally too general to address this type of a problem, okay? Um, to fight against an alleged violation of an export control in particular, um, you'd want to work with an attorney who has experience dealing with enforcement issues with regulatory compliance, right, violations, um, until it's finalized or a determination has been made, you know, your position is, hey, this is just alleged, right? Not, oh, crap, we are screwed. Um, so you especially want one who also focuses on import law, export law, export controls, and these agencies, Customs OFAC and BIS. This question we find comes up a lot, you know, it's when is it time to ask for legal help? And oftentimes, you know, by the time we hear about it, it's, it's actually too late, but uh, here's some times, you know, when, when it's time to ask. So when you suspect, or you know you're being investigated, uh, when you suspect you're being investigated, that's actually the best time to go and ask for legal help. The reason for this is because uh, with several of the agencies, until there is a formal investigation, that is until you receive a letter or phone call where you're being told, hi, your company's under investigation, you have an opportunity to get ahead of that, right? So if you suspect it, it's, okay, let's go back, let's look at some transactions, let's reach out to counsel who actually understands how these investigations work so we can come forward and say, hey, uh, we think there might have been an error. We're going to look into it and get back to you on it. Okay, you want to come forward and in doing so, you're able to avoid certain other penalty structures, these frameworks that come out that are connected to a formal investigation. Uh, another time where you can think, oh, this might be time to get legal help um, is when the goods never arrived and the company you purchased from says, hey, it's not their problem, it never arrived. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't know who's at fault. We don't know if you're a victim, right, to some other third party. We don't know if it's because this U.S. seller actually has been engaged in wrongful sales and prohibited transactions, and therefore they're under investigation, but hey, we just didn't know, right? So we bought from them anyway, and now we're the victim. Or it could be, oh, my foreign purchaser has been involved with sales that amount to prohibited transactions. So anytime there's this, hey, too bad, so sad type of attitude, that's a time to say, hey, maybe we need to get some legal help. Um, and a third example is when you suspect or know that the other party in a transaction is being investigated. So if the shipment doesn't arrive, again, coming back to our example, there may be discussions had and the discussions may elicit, you know, just casually, oh, yeah, you know, this happened to us before. It wasn't a big deal. Okay. Well, maybe that wasn't a big deal, but maybe that created, you know, an investigation. And obviously the agencies don't say, hi, by the way, we're going to start an investigation in a few months. Just, you know, just want to give you a heads up so you can clean up your act. No, they keep it closed. They don't tell you until they tell you. And so um, any time that you suspect that uh, that a party, you know, may be investigated, they gave you some idea that this is happening, you want to go ahead and, and talk to, you know, management or the C-suite, hey, I think we need to get some help here. Um, now, of course, our law firm, we do help with these types of matters, uh, but hopefully you're watching this and, you know, you don't have any problem. Uh, you're not yet under an investigation, but of course, if you are, uh, we have a QR code here. Our website's at the bottom. You can email us uh, and we can you know, get you talking to somebody right away. Uh, but thinking about how probably most of you watching this are not in that situation. Uh, we want to help you stay out of that situation. And so what we've got here for you is a bonus. Uh, you can scan the QR code here. This is a tip sheet 
uh, for compliance with U.S. Customs and Office of Foreign Assets Control regulations, okay? Uh, whether you're able to scan the QR code or right beneath that, there is uh, the, the web link to get it. You could type that in as well. And when you scan on that, then you're able to come to this screen. On this screen, you will press this button here, click here to get your bonus down at the bottom in purple. And when you click on that, there will be a pop-up. You just plug in your name, your email, your company and title, and click get your bonus now. When you do that, then you'll have the bonus available for you to download. Okay. Um, so in addition to this, uh, Kathy also, you know, in addition to this, I also wanted to share with you that we do have a vast library of YouTube videos, some of them on here, which are directly related to the topic today. Um, goods seized by U.S. Customs, what are my options? What to do if you've received a U.S. Customs seizure notice? Top three OFAC mistakes even experienced exporters make, and why am I being penalized for end users? These are just some of the videos that we have to help educate you on what to do or how to prevent wrongdoing from occurring. And if you're unable to use the QR code here to get over to our website, you can also visit us at the link at the top of the screen or just head to Google and type in our law firm name and the word YouTube and it will bring that up. Feel free to subscribe to be the latest to know about any new videos that we put out. Um, so, you know, with that, I invite you to get the bonus now. Uh, we can also be followed on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, and again, we always have useful information that we're passing out. We also announce different events that we're going to have. So I invite you to reach out to us and thanks for listening. Subscribe and click the bell icon so you'll be the first to know when we upload a new video. Check out our playlist if you want to see more of our videos and comment below and introduce yourself. We'll see you soon.